Here is the first application of differentiation of vector valued functions. And can you really call it an application? It's not really an application, it's an observation, but it will be very insightful even in a lot of real life uh, situations. So here's the statement, the observation, that if we have a function u of t and it's constant length. So remember how last time we said that any vector valued function can be thinked of as a curve. Thinked, that's what I said. I did say that, right? So any vector valued function can be thought of as a curve, but don't do it yet, right? Let's just work with the statement algebraically. So here is what we're given. The length of u is a constant, okay? Then the derivative of u, then the derivative of this function is orthogonal to u. So first we'll treat it algebraically or maybe analytically. You know, when derivatives are involved, you start saying analytically instead of algebraically, but it's really the same thing. So let's treat it analytically and then we'll interpret it geometrically, which will actually be interesting in a couple of ways. Well, number one, the way you solve any of these problems, I've mentioned it before, but now you'll see it in action, is whatever the geometric statement is, you have to translate it into vector speak, which means you have to express whatever statement you make about the geometry, you have to translate it into the three vector operations that are available. Vector addition, multiplication by a scalar, and the dot product. And here we only need one of the two, one of the three, <laughs> and that is the dot product. How do we say that the length of u is constant? Well, we say that u dotted with itself. I should really write c squared if it's the same constant, but I don't want to write c squared. So let's just c be the constant that equals this. If the length is constant, this represents the length squared, so the length squared is constant. Let's denote that constant by c. And now we'll use the only available operation at our disposal that makes sense in this context, and that's the derivative. And we're going to take the derivatives of both sides. And this cannot be complicated, and it won't be complicated. Let's see what we get. What rule are we going to use? Yeah, the product rule or the dot product rule. Which one did you say? So we get u prime u plus u u prime equals zero. Let's just write it down. Quick question. You see this zero? Is this zero the number or zero the vector? Right, number. So the only reason I'm saying, of course you all said the correct thing, but that's how my brain works. When I see this symbol in a context where it can mean more than one thing, I have to linguistically be very clear to myself what I'm looking at. So I actually say to myself, zero the number. Okay, well obviously these two terms are the same, so this simplifies to cancel the two, and what do we have? The derivative of u is orthogonal to u. Very nice. Super simple? Just as simple as it should be. It couldn't be more complicated, it definitely couldn't be simpler. Right? Very fundamental statement with a very straightforward derivation. Now let's think about the interpretation. Well, you know that if u represents the position, that's that curve interpretation, we'll actually do it second. But if u represents the position, then u prime represents the velocity. But let's go one step further. We'll come back to that interpretation in just a moment. Uh, the interpretation I'm more interested in right now is that if u represents velocity, then u prime represents acceleration. So this is saying that if a car is moving with constant speed, right, that's speed versus velocity. This doesn't say constant velocity. Constant velocity means you're moving uniformly uh, along a straight line. That's constant velocity. This is constant speed. The car could still be going on a path that curves. But if it's going with constant speed, along a curved trajectory, then its acceleration points in the direction orthogonal to the trajectory. 
Okay, so let me make the, or have I already made the statement 10 times? I kind of feel like, you know, putting a bow on it. If a car moves along a trajectory with constant speed, then its acceleration points in the normal direction. Now, it might be acceleration is not constant magnitude at all, because when the curve is greater, this is something we'll study next time, the acceleration is greater. So here, vector acceleration is probably zero. You know, so the whole, all that the acceleration does here is make you go around the curve. So this is the, this is the force of your tires gripping the road. That's what's giving you this acceleration. It's, it's the force of friction that's giving you the acceleration you need to stay on the road. We usually don't think of friction as a force that gives you acceleration. It's usually something that takes acceleration away. But static, this is static friction. That's where it comes from. So that's a very nice interpretation, right? Something that's good to know. I don't know if we experience it in real life. I think we do. I think we do. I think when you are, if you're sitting in your car with your eyes closed and you go around the curve, you can tell by how you feel whether you're just going around the curve or whether the driver is pressing on the gas or on the brake at the same time, right? You can kind of tell which it is. And I think what your brain is processing is whether you're just being pushed outwards or whether you're also being pressed into your seat or letting up on your seat, right? So we can feel it. Yeah, so this, let's just all agree that this corresponds to our everyday experience. Now let's go to the other interpretation where U represents position and see, let's see what that interpretation is. Well, if U represents position, now we have to find our arbitrary origin, and u of t, let's just use, draw it at some moment of time, here, but then it varies with t, but in a way that length is preserved, right, constant length, u is constant length, well that means that you're just constrained to being on the circle, right? That doesn't mean that you go around the circle uniformly. You might be going back and forth, right, Depend, depending on well, what u of t is, but the tip is constrained to being on the circle. Always draw the circle first, then identify the center. So it's like, I see, one sec. Ah, so this is like uh, a needle on a dial, right, that just keeps going back and forth. And it's also interesting, if we took the velocity field that looks like this, it's a constant vector that points in the tangential direction, kind of like this, and then combine them all to emanate from a common origin, then it would just sort of be like this, right? It would just sort of be jerking back and forth as a, need as a little needle. Yes, that's right. You're exactly right. In 3D, it would be on a sphere. You're right. I was just thinking in 2D. That's a very valid thing. I think everything I'm saying today is valid in 3D as well. So yeah, constraint to be on a sphere. That's right. And so when, when a when a material particle is, so that's the interpretation, if a material particle, which I'm thinking of as the tip of this vector, is constrained to living on a circle, moving only on a circle or a sphere, then its acceleration is always orthogonal to it, which means points directly in towards the center of the sphere, right? Once again, magnitude might be different depending on whether it's going fast around a circle or a sphere or slowly, but it's always points towards the center and never outward. Isn't that interesting? Regardless, that's another thing we'll talk about next time, but whether it moves in this direction or in the opposite direction, doesn't matter. Acceleration always points towards the center and we, don't, we can't say anything about magnitude. Okay. Very nice, right? Very simple. Look at the analytical complexity of what we're working with. Okay, so that's one application.